together for worship this last Sunday in January. Um, for those of you who are online, uh, if you do experience any technical difficulties, there is a phone number you can text, 403-796-8213, and we will do what we can to help you out with the situation, uh, whatever it may be, but hopefully there's no tech difficulties, and we can just enjoy worship together this morning. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite people here in the sanctuary to get up and greet one another. Uh, for those of you online, if you haven't already, just welcome one another in the chat. And for those of us in here, make sure to wave at the camera, and uh, you'll be able to just say hi to those who are joining together online. And so let's just greet one another in worship, and we'll or, uh, greet one another, and then we'll come back to worship together. <laughs> Morning. Morning, mate. Let us worship God together. Shout to the, for joy to the Lord, says the psalmist, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Let's worship the Lord together today. Good morning. It's so good to see all of you. Let's, uh, let's worship the Lord with God so love. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table he will satisfy. Of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of 
to save us. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom. For God so loved, God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. song we're going to do is Lord I need you and it says in the first line is Lord I come I confess lying here I find my rest so if there's anything that you need to confess this morning now is the perfect time
Teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. I cannot stand or fall on you. Jesus, you're my whole man stay. I cannot stand. Lord, thank you that it is easy and quick for us to come to you with all our sins and all our confessions. Lord, we want to ask you forgiveness for anything that we've done that might have come against our relationship with you, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to uh, to hear your voice and to come back to you. We, we ask this all in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. I get the privilege of um, leading us in prayer this morning. And um, just before I do, I just want to go through some of the prayer requests and praises that have been happening over the last little while um, and then read something that God reminded me of <coughs> earlier this week. Um, as we know, there's lots going on. Um, people are always, um, because of the you know <laughs> crumbling tents that we live in, um, always have something going on, but there are a number in our congregation who aren't doing great um, in a number of different ways, and so they could just really use your prayer. Um, Grace Riba is now in hospital as they're trying to figure out what is the cause of all of this pain, um, and so just to be with her and her caregivers, um, where she does live when she does return, she'll be getting full-time care, which is great, um, but just to what figure out what's causing the pain and so that she can be comforted. Um, and Daryl 
is having cataract surgery um, coming up. So just pray for that and for the speedy recovery. And um, I guess just praise that we can do that. Cataracts caused blindness not too long ago. And now um, just a praise that that is something that can happen. Um, and a praise that um, arts skin cancer removal has been moved up three weeks. He's actually going in on Tuesday now um, for that. So that's good. Tuesday, right? Yeah. Um, so that's that's a praise too. And, and the graft eye are all here today. Um, and all of them good. So that's great. Um, if you're feeling like you need an extra ounce of luck, go give Tracy a quick rub because uh, she managed to get out of that scot-free. Um, so just praise um, for them and, and just, you know, even for the science that let us, you know, test and know so that they could stay home and keep others safe. So that's great. Um, also praise that Jen's parents, Sylvia and Maurice, are both on the mend and Sylvia is back home. So um, for that, and just pray for the whole family. Um, neither Sylvia nor Maurice are big fans of hospitals, so it was very mentally stressful um, for all of them, um, for Jen and, and her siblings and for mom and dad to be in the hospital. So just to pray for continued healing, not just physically, but emotionally as they um, get over that. My own father-in-law hated being in the hospital, so I know what that's like. So just pray for them as well. Um, and then people who continue to need our prayer. Annette, um, who's been able to come on and off over the last little while. She actually broke her femur in December and so is not able to get around too great. And so just pray for her and feelings of isolation when you can't get around and how that can compound. Continue to pray for my friends, the Renegs. Um, JR is still in hospital after losing a foot due to diabetes complications. And Tammy is still off work with a, what they considered moderate concussion, but it's, it's hanging on for quite some time. So um, just for them. Um, and then just all those we've, you know, Bonnie's out of town living in Vancouver with her family now and her mom is not well. Um, pray for just unity in the church and in our country and in our city. Um, we need to remember that we were made by a communal God for community. Um, so let's pray for that. Um, some praises as well. The Vares and Alette and Stefan get to finally make their trip to South Africa. Um, which will be great to see their parents um, and to be with them. And then on Friday, 11 of our youth, along with Tim, who is youthful, and Noel will be heading up to the Gull Lake Winter Camp as a group, and Hudson will be there working as one of the Gull Lake staffers. So I had a weekend to myself. I'm a little jealous. I'd rather be at camp, to be honest, but um, it's just praise. We've got 11 kids going to the senior high camp. So that's awesome. And pray for our high school across the street. Um, Mike Wilson was seconded to head office downtown and um, is no longer the principal there. He's a area director. And so they're looking for a new principal. And so just be in prayer for that and for the um, relationship we have with the high school um, and keep that up. And now, um, I want to read to you from 2 Corinthians 5. Oh, da, da, da. Sorry, I gotta find it now. Okay, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. And I just needed that reminder that we messed up, but God reconciled us to him. He made that first step. And that was just a reminder I needed this morning. So let's pray as we remember that grace and compassion. Abba Father, you've heard this list of praises and prayer requests. And the amazing, almost incomprehensible thing is that you knew it all before any 
that came to mind or was spoken. And that you love to hear from us. You love to hear from your children. You love to hear our praises, our hurts. You listen to our anger and frustration. You listen to our joy. And you do so with, while standing in the midst of us, like Revelation says, but while standing in the midst of us, you're also holding us together. And I thank you for that. And I thank you that your promises are true. And in this world, to confess, we often listen to so many other things and we get bound up by the weeds and lies of the enemy and the world that tells us to think or dress or act in a certain way to gain acceptance. But Lord, our acceptance, our worth, our love, it, uh, it's all in you. And it was enough that from the very beginning, you made sure that there was a way that we could be in relationship with you regardless of what we've done. And you continue to reconcile us to you, even though we're the ones that keep messing up. So thank you for that grace. Thank you for that compassion. Thank you for that love. And as we move in our days and our years, and even in our minutes, help us to draw on your strength to be your ambassadors, to stand in your name, to stand in your presence, and to shed and reflect your light to the world to act with compassion, to act with grace and patience and mercy and love and to be joyful and to share that joy with those around us and to share all that you've done for us with those around us. It's very scary, but we just pray for your strength to do that. And we look to those, to you who are hurting, whether it be emotionally or physically, that you would be with them. Um, Yahweh Rofi, that you would come and restore them to wholeness we pray for guidance and wisdom um, for doctors involved in surgeries and care in the upcoming weeks and for the process of a new principal across the street. Heavenly Father, thank you for that connection and just pray that you would um, continue to give us inroads into that school for so long as you would have us do your work there. And within our own community here in Crescent and in Calgary and in the greater world, Lord God, we pray for unity of your family that we would come together, even though we know we have differences, but that we would be united in your love and in the mission of bringing your word and your saving grace to a needy world. In your name, Father, we pray. Amen. Revelations 5, the scroll and the lamb. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seal, seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe 
and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. morning once again. I hope as Sonny read the message as you saw it up there or on the screen for those of you at home, I hope you captured what was going on there. The, as I continue to read chapters 4 and chapters 5, um, we're, as we travel through the book of Revelation, we're starting to get, this is, we're kind of right on the precipice of jumping into this dark ocean of Revelation 6 and onward that we're going to get into. And so we really need to capture where we are right now and really embed within our minds and our hearts the message that Jesus is trying to share through John to the seven churches in Asia Minor at the time and to you and I here today. Because remember, the book of Revelation is a letter about Jesus and from Jesus given through the Apostle John, uh, Apostle John to warn as well as to encourage the church. And no better place, other than at the end, Revelation 21 and 22, but no better place that we see that encouragement than here in chapters 4 and chapters 5. Because remember, we've just come off of this very intimate word to seven different churches. Jesus has spoken to these seven churches that were kind of on a male route in Asia, and come, coming off of Patmos onto Ephesus and up and around the loop, the, these messages would have gone, where Jesus confronts these churches directly. And there was three kind of overarching problems that, that they were facing, or problems that each of the churches were facing. The first was the problem of assimilation, as Craig Coster calls it. The problem of being united as one people. And so the, the church in Ephesus, they were doing all the right things, but they had completely lost what it meant to be the people of love who had a love for Christ. They, were, they were just had become taskmasters, making sure their doctrine was correct, but forgetting what it means to be in intimate relationship with Jesus and with one another. Then there's two other churches that were struggling with this, Pergamum and Thyatira. They were full of idolatry. They had allowed uh, uh, idolatrous teaching. They were allowed sexual immorality. They were worshiping other gods. They were allowing foreign uh, worship into the service. They weren't doing what Ephesus was doing, but Jesus says to them, hey, you're, you're doing the right things in terms of caring for one another and proclaiming Jesus, but you're also mixing in this other stuff. And you need to fix that. And so the first problem that churches faced, these churches and, and us here in the 21st century as well, is one of assimilation. The second was the problem of persecution. And those two churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, they were actually being really faithful to Christ. Despite this external pressure, they were facing a problem of external pressure. They were, businesses were being shut down. They were being inhibited from doing what they wanted to do publicly. They had to go underground and hide for face of persecution. They were remaining faithful. And Jesus just said, hold on a little longer. Keep going. Keep remaining faithful. Finally, the third problem that these churches were facing, that the church throughout history has faced, is the problem of complacency. When we become satisfied in the life that we currently have it, where we have enough money and food and resources and there's no problems, the government doesn't care what we're doing, our neighbor doesn't care what we're doing, we're just living life large and in charge. Everything is good. And Jesus comes to those churches, to Sardis and to Laodicea, and says, you've got to wake up. You're not worshiping me anymore. You're not being the church anymore. You're a shadow of who you're to be. You're just living life as every other citizen that's around you is. And so after this very intimate interaction with his churches, 
John is given a second vision. Something new is going to take place. Jesus calls the five churches, five of the churches back into proper relationship with him in terms of their practice and lifestyle. And to, but to all seven of these churches, he promises victory to the overcomer. And so no matter whether they're doing things wrong, no matter whether they've lost their love, no matter whether they've blended into society, Jesus says, when you come back to me, when you enter in, when you become, when you are an overcomer of these things that are challenging you to become all I've created you to be, victory will be yours. The white robe will be placed upon you, the crown upon your head. You will enter into and become all that God has created the, you to be. And so after he says this, and I want to just touch briefly on chapter 4, John says, after I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said to me, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. After the churches had been addressed, after the encouragement to become all they were created to be, to leave their false and bad practices, their unholy practices, here's what may ta must take place after this. After Things have been made known. After his messages to the churches, Jesus reveals to John why it is so important for them to purge idolatry, for them to remain faithful in the face of persecution, why it's important that they stop being uh, content with life on earth and to see something more, why it was important that he correct those who were missing the mark. Jesus gives John and thereby the churches and you and I collectively a glimpse behind the curtain of what else is going on. In the face of persecution, in the face of complacency, in the face of infighting, there's more going on. Whatever situation you find yourself in right now, John is saying to, or Jesus is saying to John and John to you and I, there's more happening than what you're seeing with your eyes. And what he sees uh, is who is ultimately in control. In chapters 4 and 5, Jesus gives John an incredible image of what is really going on and who is ultimately in control and worthy of worship. And so in chapter 4, we see this throne room with elders and beasts. Beasts who seem to be the worship leaders. And I will never call our worship leaders beasts in that context. But that's what they seem to be doing to lead the elders and eventually the angels and all tribes and nations in worship of the one who is worthy to sit on the throne. And so John, after hearing this message about, oh man, five of these churches are not doing well. Two of these churches are suffering incredibly. Jesus gives John this vision of the one seated on the throne. And these strange and interesting beasts representing all of the created order, worshiping him. And 24 elders in, in white robes and crowns seated upon their thrones. But when the beasts speak, they fall down in worship. They take off their crowns and lay prostrate before the one who is worthy to receive worship. The vision that John is given is not a Philadelphia cream cheese ad of angels sitting on clouds playing harps and eating food. No, the vision of heaven that John is given is one where there's lightning and thunder bursting forth from the throne. Where worship is happening in an incredible way. And I don't know about you, but I've heard people in the past talk about, well, I don't want to go to heaven because I don't want to worship the whole time. It sounds really boring. And if you follow the Philadelphia cream cheese ads from the 90s and 2000s, I would agree wholeheartedly. But that's not the picture that John is giving. He's given one that is awe-inspiring and in many ways very terrifying. Because I don't know about you, but if I entered into a room, if I walked through a door into a place where there is someone seated on a throne whose, whose image I could not describe, and from that throne lightning is flashing out everywhere, and the sound of thunder, thunder is crashing down upon me, my eyes would open much, much wider. I would not be bored. I would be, as the elders were, and as John most definitely was, terrified. And I would probably fall down, maybe partly to avoid the lightning, but I would fall down because there was something going on in this place that I could not describe or understand. And so if you were one of the churches who were at all questioning who is speaking to you, 
the vision that John is given in chapters 4 through 7, of which we'll cover next week. The one who says to wake up, the one who says, let me in to dine with you. If you're at all questioning who is speaking, this new vision that John receives answers that question. The one who is seated on the throne, who is worthy of worship. The entire created order is present around God in heaven. And this lightning and this thunder is flashing out. And interestingly, and we'll cover it next week, but this lightning and this thunder comes forth from the throne, but it also comes as the opening of the seals happens, as the blaring of the trumpets happens, as the pouring out of the bowls happens. Lightning and thunder shows up throughout the rest of Revelation, and it's all rooted right here in the throne room of God, coming forth from the one who is worthy of worship because he created all things. From chapters 4 to 5, the worship then, and this is where we're going to dive in, the worship of God for his role in creation gives way in this second vision, or this uh, furthering of the vision in chapter 5, to the worship of the Lamb and worshiping for his work in redemption. As Lisa read, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. And I wept. And I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. I just realized, sorry, Sonny, it was Sonny who read Scripture for us this morning. John has given the message to the church, received the message to the churches that he is to deliver. He sees this vision. He sees this, this, this seal in the right hand of God seated on the throne. And an angel in a booming voice is proclaiming who is worthy and there is no one worthy. The seal, the scroll of destiny, God's plan to complete his creation, to bring everything back under his authority and order to remove sin, no one is worthy to open it up. And John weeps bitterly. He laments because this well-sealed scroll is going to remain wrapped up. This edict of God, this proclamation, this plan that he's put into place is going to remain sealed because there's no one that can open it up. John's stuck on the island and churches that are at risk of being disconnected from Christ, the the situation breaks his heart when no one is found worthy to open these seals and to change the destiny of what's going on. This may not be unlike John the Baptist, if you remember. When he sent his disciples, John the Baptist is sitting in jail for his message, for stirring trouble, for pointing to Jesus. John is, the Baptist is sitting in jail, and he sends his disciples to Jesus to ask, are you the one that was proclaimed or should we wait for someone else? As John's sitting in that jail cell, he begins to wonder, is this worth it? Is this message that I thought I was to be proclaimed, to be proclaiming, did I point to the right guy? Jesus turns to his disciples and says to them, go tell John what you see. The blind can see again. The sick are made well. Those in prison are being freed. But like both Johns, you and I feel that way as well. We sometimes wonder, is God really in control? Is his plan really being worked out? I mean, it's been 2,000 years and there's still wars and there's still earthquakes and there's still sickness and there's still persecution. There's been no government or legislation or leader or group that has changed the destiny of humankind. Things are still messed up. Our governments continue to fail us. Our economy is still a roller coaster. Our family and friends often let us down. We don't live up to our own expectations. And when we see that, as John did, that seal that was, or that scroll that was sealed, we weep as well. The church is suffering. How long does it need to suffer? The church is failing in its mission. How long are we going to be going the wrong direction? There's no hope and the dismay of where things are at. And we ask ourselves, is this really all there is? 
John is weeping because he's feeling that weight. It begs the question for John and for you and I in the face of disaster and difficulty and troubled situations, illness, children who have gone astray, abuses that have been suffered in society, in the church, in our families, in the midst of financial job loss and death of a loved one, we, like John, ask the question, God, are you really in control? Is this all life is going to be? In the midst of wars and societal division, the plight of the poor, the sick and the dying, John weeps. He laments. All hope seems lost. In the face of incredible worship of the one who's created all things, if that scroll cannot be opened, we're stuck where we are. Evil has won. And as John's lamenting, one of the elders says to him, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And in John's mind, as in the mind of any Jewish person, he would have been remembering Isaiah's uh, prophecies. He would have been remembering Ezekiel's messages. He would have been remembering Zechariah's prophecies. He would have been remembering Genesis and the work that had gone on there where God rescued his people, or had called out a people, I should say, to rescue all of creation. This elder comes to John and says, do not weep. The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. And in John's mind, most definitely, and in your mind and I, we would expect the one who triumphed to be one who is powerful and strong, commanding an army, would have some sort of influence and ability to change all things. But when John turns, he sees a lamb looking as if it had been slain. But it's not a dead lamb. It's a lamb standing in the middle of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and he took the scroll, this now resurrected lamb, from the right hand of him who sits on the throne. As John's weeping, as he's heartbroken, as the the pressures and the, and the the concerningness that there is no one worthy, an elder points him to the lamb that is seated on the throne. The lion in the tribe of Judah was not one who was powerful in war, who was not one wise in the wisdom of this earth, but is the one who had been slain, whose horns represent the power of God and whose eyes represent the wisdom of God to enter into life and to take the scroll and to open it. The one worthy is none other than the Son of God himself. With his proper and complete power, with his proper and complete wisdom that had gone out throughout the entire earth. Remember Paul's letter to the Corinthians, that church that was not unlike these seven churches that Jesus is is, uh, uh, confronting here in Revelation, not unlike you and I, not unlike the church down the street. It was a church that was full of all sorts of problems and infighting and idolatry. Paul says to them, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Wise person, Paul says. Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has, God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. In all of our own Thinking in all of our own abilities, we don't know God, but God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. The all-powerful God entered into earth as a helpless baby in a poor family on the outskirts of a town to be worshipped by shepherds and angels. That same God John sees here seated on the throne, slain and risen again. The one who is worthy to open the seal to bring God's plan of creation to its rightful completion is none other than the Son of God who has laid down his life and purchased creation through his blood. Instead of fighting the way that the world fights, God enters in and sacrifices himself. Instead of being a priest with all authority and power in the ways of the world, he enters in as a priest who truly bows before his Father. 
And looking at the one who is worthy, John sees a little lamb who had been slain but was standing. And when he takes the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb in worship. Each one has a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of God's people, and they sang a new song. Something new had happened. It wasn't the old, God has just created the world. It was now the song of redemption, that God had actually rescued the world. Then I looked and I heard voices of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 upon 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They were saying, they were worshiping. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that was in them saying, This vision that John is given of God's throne room and the worship that is happening with these strange and bizarre beasts, with these elders that are seated on the thrones, with the thousands upon thousands of angels, and with people from every tribe and nation, that image needs to rest within us, buried deep within our heart, form and shape how we live, because it's going to be how we're going to be able to see well the rest of the vision that John is given. When the scroll has been taken by the Lamb who was slain, only then can true worship take place. Only then can God's redemptive plan be brought to completion. To him who sits upon the throne and the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. With your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. And as this was being sung, as this was being proclaimed, the four elders, or the four living creatures said, Amen, and everyone fell in worship. And we have to understand a little bit here, in the the, our translations don't fully capture what's going on, at least the NIV doesn't. It just says the creatures said Amen, but what's really going on there is Amen, and Amen, and Amen. With every statement of praise, with every uh, utterance of who God is and why he's, Jesus is worthy to be worshipped, the, el- the four creatures are saying, Amen. Chapter 4 showcases the throne room of God, the one who is worthy of all our worship and majesty, of the God as he sits upon his throne. But then chapter five, 5 reveals the central truth that governs the rest of the book of Revelation that by his sacrificial death, the Lamb has taken control of the course of history and guaranteed its future. By his perfect wisdom and his perfect power, which was and is to lay down his life as a sacrifice for those he loved, creation will come to completion. And so as you and I sit in this time, in this place, facing economic uncertainties, pandemics that rage across the world, wondering if we're going to get on a plane on Wednesday to go see family or not, Illness, sickness, being separated from loved ones because of health reasons or because of relational breakdowns. Whatever difficult and uncontrollable situation you find yourself right in, chapters 4 and 5 tell us that he is seated on the throne, that he is worthy of worship, that the wisdom of God is not to fight against evil with evil, but the wisdom of God is to lay down one's life in love for those around us. And when that happens, worship takes place. He is worthy of, he is the one who is worthy of your worship and he's worthy of my worship. He's the one who's worthy to take the scroll and to bring creation to its completion and so no matter what circumstance you find yourself today, what must take place is what has already taken place. Because the lamb was slaughtered and brought back to life. Jesus laid down his life and was resurrected. And therefore you and I are free to live as the redeemed people of God when we trust in him. When we place our life in his, when we take up our cross and follow him, we are freed in his death and resurrection to live as we were created to live, as the redeemed people of God, to be a kingdom of priests serving our God, with every breath that we have on this side of heaven. And when we capture that in our minds and in our hearts, 
when we capture that in the ways that we live our life moment by moment, day by day, trusting in him despite the news headlines or the circumstances we find ourselves in, when we're like the church in Smyrna and Philadelphia, we will say, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power. Amen, the beast would shout. Wisdom, amen, the beast would shout. Wealth, amen, and honor and glory and praise, amen. That's the vision we need to capture. Because as we approach and find these dragons and these beasts that we're going to encounter later on in the book of Revelation, we need to remember, he who is worthy is seated on the throne, and we are called to follow him in worship. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the life that you have given us. We thank you for this vision you gave John to share to the church, both back in the first century, but also throughout the centuries to be reminded that you are seated on the throne. And so, Lord, we lift up to you our difficult situations. We lift up the pressures of this life, illness, relationships, financial challenges, physical ailing. We lift it up to you, Lord. And we pray by your Spirit you would continue to lead us to be faithful in all things, to trust you with our whole life, and to worship you no matter the circumstances, for you are the one who is worthy. Amen.
for the offering. Father God, we thank you for today. Thank you for the gift of life we have. And as we give your offering today, we pray, God, that it would be used for the work of your kingdom. Help us to be good stewards of the resources uh, we are entrusted with, that we would proclaim that the kingdom of God has come and that the king's name is Jesus. We pray, Lord, that we would make disciples, teaching them everything that you have taught us. And so we pray your blessing upon this offering today. Amen. You want to go see Dad? Okay. Uh, Just a few announcements uh, before we conclude uh, this morning. Um, I would invite you this week, as you go about your day, as you think about the things that you're engaged in, that you would call someone. Someone maybe you know, someone maybe you don't know as well, and just say, how is it going? What's happening? Um, How can I pray for you? That we would be the praying people of God. Um, Throughout the week, we're continuing to have Tuesday morning prayer, or Tuesday evening prayer on Zoom at 7.30 as well as gathering in the mornings before service at 9.45 to pray, Uh, please come, participate as we pray together that we would be the praying people of God. As Lisa had mentioned earlier, our our junior and senior and college uh, group is heading to Gull Lake this upcoming weekend, so pray for safety on the road. Uh, And Ange, in all her cleverness, put in here, pray for safety of travels and no potholes, because the last time we rented a van, some doofus uh, named Tyler broke the van. And so uh, that was many years ago we'd forgotten about that Ange, uh, until you put it in the notes here. But uh, yeah, pray for Tim and, Ange, or Tim and Noel and Hudson and the, the youth that are all going, uh, that they would encounter Christ, that they would worship together up at Gull Lake. And uh, just finally, um, the, we're going to have our annual meeting, as we always do at the end of February, and it'll be here in person as well as through a Zoom meet so that everyone has opportunity to participate. And so please mark that on your calendars. That's February 27th uh, is our annual meeting um, to just celebrate God's faithfulness through the last year in all the ups and downs and differences that we've, uh, challenges that we've faced. I think that is all the announcements for today. Uh, let's please stand with me for the benediction. Lord God, we come before you as the people that you have redeemed, that you have called to follow you in every direction and in every circumstance, to remain faithful despite pressure, to remain united despite differences. And so we pray, Lord, that as we go forth from this place, that your love would pour out on us, that your grace would abound within us, and that your fellowship by your Spirit would unite us, that we might proclaim that the kingdom has come and the King truly is worthy of worship. Amen. May the blessing of God be upon you as you go forth from this place. Have a great afternoon and week.